time of day, it's already a struggle. Uh, as soon as James Harden decided he was going into Houston Harden mode, the Nets had no choice. Durant for three. And by the way, mention in Providence College. Miami sends Brooklyn home. I plan on resigning here next year. They thought things would be different, but a first round loss and a sweep. When it comes to sports, no other league is as superstar driven as the NBA. And with enough collection of stars on one team, comes the dangerous label of being called a super team. Super teams are always under a microscope from the rest of the league and face the immense pressure of contending for championships right away. But what separates a one year playoff run from sustained dominance for a few years is when an organization that struggles to win games comes off of that sustained high from tasting success and doesn't completely jump the shark. Because there's always the chance of your team collapsing and falling down the abyss that is mediocrity, which essentially you'll become irrelevant and worst of all with no future in sight. The Brooklyn Nets are currently going through a massive roster reconstruction this offseason, and with James Harden already being out the door a while back, and the Kevin Durant trade request and rumors, I think it was time to take a look at not just how everything went wrong for the big three this season, but how the Nets have nearly repeated the same thing almost a decade prior. But in order to accurately describe how the Brooklyn Nets have flown too close to the sun in two different decades, I think it's best to go all the way back to the beginning. Figuring just exactly how the Nets can get back into final contention with this roster and this salary cap makes my brain hurt. So if you want to give me an ease of mind, hitting the like and subscribe button would be greatly appreciated and it lets me know what type of content you guys would like to see from this channel moving forward. The year is 2009. Russian billionaire Mikhail Prokhorov purchases the New Jersey Nets for $400 million. With an initial 80% share of Barclays Center, he's an owner who simply wants his team to be the greatest thing ever since sliced bread by any means necessary. He has one goal and an interesting approach at the very least to completely turn the Nets around. Instead of building through the draft and just tanking like half of the league for a couple of years, Mikhail promised to Nets fans and the organization that the Nets would deliver a title in just five years. Now, at the time these very words were uttered, the Nets had just come off easily the worst record in the NBA with a 12-70 record, along with the worst attendance in the NBA. So this task wasn't exactly going to be an easy one and Mikhail needed competent front office management from the get go to make this task even remotely possible. So accompanying this speed run of a bill that Mikhail had planned was none other than Billy King, who of course was known around the league to be one of the most incompetent GMs in the NBA. <coughs> so we're already off to a good start. Take that for what you will, but how Billy King drastically changes the future of the Nets in just a short span a 5 years for the worse is a quite impressive tutorial of what not to do when rebuilding a team. Immediately after the disastrous 2010 season, the Nets got to work rather quickly, attempting to reach out to multiple superstars in that 2010 offseason, even pitching for LeBron and his friends to come compete in Brooklyn. Despite this, the Nets simply just couldn't find anyone who would play for a team with the worst record in basketball the season prior, so the front office opted for a different strategy, trading any viable asset in long term futures such as draft picks for already proven players to compete right now, thinking that those picks they traded to any team won't matter in the future because the Nets will simply be too good and simply title contenders. Which couldn't be any further than what actually happened. The Nets started off reasonably with some of their trades and then decided to completely jump the gun, as in 2010, the Nets got their first big trade in that season. Shortly after failing the trade for Carmelo Anthony, the Nets instead got all-star point guard Darren Williams. Trading away Devin Harris, the third overall pick in that year's draft, Derek Favors, as well as a 2011 first round pick and 2013 first round pick. The Nets from there would go on to slowly, if not surely, improve their winning percentage in a span of three years, trading for Portland small forward Jared Wallace in the 2011-2012 season, then for all-star shooting guard Joe Johnson a year later. 
Though it would take a king's ransom to the Hawks, a disgusting contract to take on for the Nets to get Joe Johnson and Jared Wallace, the Nets had improved from a 22-44 season the year prior to a 49-33 record and a 5th seed in the Eastern Conference. Touting a solid roster with Brooke Lopez, Reggie Evans, Jared Wallace, Joe Johnson, and Darren Williams. Despite the Nets losing in 7 games to the Chicago Bulls in the first round of that year's playoffs, it was technically their first year together with this new roster, so hopefully with enough time and smart trades, the Nets could have had enough to compete against teams like the Miami Heat. One small problem though, the Nets have a GM who had just come off wasting a superstar's prime for most of the previous decade, and Billy King's determination to get whatever players he wanted by any means necessary is the exact reason why the Nets had just come off a playoff appearance, and the reason why the Nets are still living with the mismanagement of his front office from nearly a decade prior. He had the right idea in making a trade that would push the Nets as contending champions, but I think simply just looked for the wrong franchise to find it. And that team that Billy King was desperately looking for was none other than the Boston Celtics, who had just recently lost to a Carmelo Anthony-led Knicks team and whose top players were just simply regressing with age. There was always the possibility that trading for 35-year-old players wasn't exactly the greatest idea, but Billy King could see it all now. Sweeping the heat, winning back-to-back -back finals, Kevin Garnett saying that anything is possible for his team, and the Nets being the biggest thing in the Big Apple. But unfortunately for the Nets, there was a GM who saw right through King's desperation. Deciding to squeeze out every last asset the Celtics could get out of the Nets, the trade went through on July 12, 2013. And the Nets received Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Jason Terry, DJ White, a 2017 first round pick, in a 2017 second round pick. At the expense of getting this aging core, the Nets gave away practically their entire future, giving away Keith Bogans, Chris Joseph, Gerald Wallace, Chris Humphreys, Marshawn Brooks, a 2014 first round pick, a 2016 first round pick, a 2017 first round pick, and a 2018 first round pick. I understand that trades are important for any competent organization to still be competitive, but going one step forward and getting rid of Walsh's contract, and about three steps back and trading away your entire future for passer prime players, not only gives you just a very small window to compete, but with no championship or future to show for, if things simply just don't work out. Which is exactly what happened the very next season, because the 2013-14 Nets fell way short of expectations going 44 and 38 in the regular season and then proceeding to lose to the Miami Heat in 5 games after multiple fourth quarter collapses. It was a season plagued with injuries, inconsistency, and dysfunction across the entire organization. But even more disappointing, this would be the best season the Nets would have under Billy King's tenure. Paul Pierce would go on to lead the Nets the following offseason and Jason Kidd would be fired as head coach after a power struggle in the front office. The next season was even worse, as the 2014-15 Nets started off the season going 18-28, which led to Kevin Garnett being traded midway through the year. With the Nets struggling to turn Darren Williams into their franchise cornerstone, the Nets would go on to barely make it into the playoffs and then proceed to lose to the one-seeded Atlanta Hawks in six games. The last remnant of that super team core would go on to be waived after the playoffs, and that trade back in 2013 meant the Nets just couldn't simply tank for draft picks. So after 6 future first round picks traded, numerous assets that were given up to make this team even remotely possible, along with questionable front office moves from the very start of Mikhail Prokhorov's and Billy King's reign of the Brooklyn Nets, the 2010 Nets would go on to teach a viable lesson to the rest of the league, which did not give up your entire future to a bunch of 35 year old players. And if you want to join any team from any era, just don't pick the 2013 Nets, or you'll contemplate quitting the sport of basketball for the rest of your life. Speaking of the 2010 Nets, for as poorly of a job the organization did in building a contending roster in those early years of the decade, the later years of the decade would prove that no matter how poor of a state your team is in, there is always a way out from a weak situation, and it doesn't have to always be through tanking for high draft picks. It did take a realization from Mikhail Prokhorov that his franchise didn't have to win a title in a 5 year span after a rebrand of the team, 
especially when that initial roster won just 12 games, but the Nets started to make smart moves. Over a 3-4 year span, the Nets would go on to build a promising roster. By replacing front office positions with competent management, trading veteran players on the team for draft picks, and looking through the G League to build on their young core, the Nets would go on to prove their critics wrong and finish with a 42-40 record in the regular season, and secured the 6th seed in the Eastern Conference back in the 2018-19 season. Touting a promising roster with players such as D'Angelo Russell, Joe Harris, Jared Allen, Spencer Dinwiddie, and Karis LeVert. It's important to mention this playoff contending team with plenty of picks and cap space to spare because this is exactly what attracts superstar free agent players. How big of a market that team is in can also affect a player's decision making, but I think the Knicks have lately shown that this always isn't the case. The Nets have just come off a 5 game series loss to the Philadelphia 76ers and were looking for a way to elevate their roster. With the loaded talent that was the 2019 for agency class, the Nets were able to acquire Kevin Durant with a sign and trade from the Warriors and Kyrie Irving who was fed up with none other than a Celtics organization. So after a 4 year $40 million signing from DeAndre Jordan, the Nets now had a superstar duo in Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Even if it did take D'Angelo Russell and about $300 million in cap space for this roster to happen, the Nets now had a roster to compete for a title in the upcoming season. And when I say now, I really mean so much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting and they had to hire a new Considering that Kevin Durant would still have an ACL tear to recover from, and the fact that Kyrie just couldn't stay healthy the year after he signed to Brooklyn, and had to undergo season-ending surgery after he had already missed 26 games from that same shoulder and other injuries. Even without their two main stars on the court, the Nets were still able to make it into the playoffs despite the injuries thanks to a bubble shortened season and players such as Jared Allen and Karis LeVert. The Nets would ultimately be swept by the Toronto Raptors, but with a healthy roster the following season, the Nets still had a good chance to be finals contenders. With Steve Nash as the new head coach following into the 2020-21 season, the Nets started off relatively slow and at the time was 7-6 three weeks into the NBA season. Luckily, they just happened to find a player who not only wants to leave his team so badly that he's missing practice and wearing fat suits, he just so happens to be a former teammate of Kevin Durant. The trade involved four different teams, but the Nets alternately got James Harden in a second round pick in exchange for center Jared Allen, Terion Prince, Karis LeVert, and three future first round draft picks. There were concerns about the Nets simply being too offensive focused while not accommodating the interior presence on the floor, and whether this current Nets lineup could stay healthy was also a serious question. Despite the Nets struggling with injuries once again throughout the entire season, they finished with the second seed in the Eastern Conference with a 48-24 record, the best offensive rating in the league, and were also able to sign LaMarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin later on in the season to help out for the inevitable playoff push. The Nets started off that year's playoffs by beating the same team that fleeced them out of all those picks years earlier in the Boston Celtics. The Nets were then set to square off against a revamped Bucks roster, who have also for the past several seasons have been trying to get over the hump and win a title. Unfortunately for the Bucks for at least the first two games, the Bucks just seemed to be outmatched by the Nets, and I say the first two games because what had plagued the Nets all season long would rear its ugly head at the worst possible time as James Harden would injure his hamstring in the opening minute of the first quarter in Game 1. The Nets were able to take Game 2 in convincing fashion, but lost in Game 3 by 3 points thanks to a 35 and 33 point performance by Chris Middleton and Giannis. Game 4 was set to be one of the most important games of the series, and about a quarter and a half into the game, Kyrie would sprain his right ankle and would be out for the remainder of the series. Both teams would go on to split the next two games of the series, but a visibly injured Harden who had dropped 5 points in Game 5, it became obvious that in order for the Nets to survive this series, the Durant would have to put the entire team on his back. And in a wildly intense Game 7, Durant did everything he possibly could, putting up 48 points in the game and hitting a game-tying shot that sent the game into overtime, and would have won the game right there if Durant's shoe was just a bit shorter. Despite the heroic effort, the performance just wasn't enough, and the Bucks pulled through in overtime, with Giannis putting up 40 points, 13 rebounds, and 5 assists to cap off the series. It was a disappointing loss for the Nets, but the organization knew that if they had a healthy team for that Bucks series, they most likely would have had an NBA title. So with virtually the same roster, the Nets decided to run it back and go all in for the 2021-22 season. But just like that super team roster back in 2013, a heartbreaking second round exit would be the furthest this Brooklyn Nets squad would go.
because before the season even started, the city of New York had a vaccine mandate for professional sports. And with Kyrie Irving deciding to not get the vaccine, this resulted in the possibility of Kyrie missing 41 games throughout the season. And in response to Kyrie's refusal to take the vaccine, a frustrated James Harden, who at this point wasn't putting up the same numbers he once was, became annoyed with Kyrie's actions. The rumors of Durant being unhappy with Harden showing up the camp out of shape, and with all the consistent injuries that were happening like clockwork for this big three, Harden felt that his time on the Nets was over. And on February 10th of this year, the Nets traded James Harden and Paul Millsap to the Sixers for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks. At the time of this trade, the Nets were sitting at the 8th seed with a 29-24 record, and without the ability to play one of their key guys in the trade that was Ben Simmons, the Nets had to make the uphill climb to salvage what was left of the season. Durant was able to return late into the season to help push his team past the playing tournament, and the Nets ended the 2021-22 season with a 44-38 record, locking the 7th seed in the Eastern Conference. Even around 9 years later, the Nets were still dealing with the repercussions from that trade in that year's playoffs, as those picks the Celtics had were used to grab Jalen Brown in 2016 and Jason Tatum in 2017, who are now one of the biggest factors to the Nets getting swept in that year's playoffs. Life is crazy! <laughs> Without the help of another scorer taking the load from Kyrie and Durant, the Celtics were able to focus on the two players throughout the whole series. Despite the competitive four games, the Nets were swept by the Celtics, and the front office was left last season with more questions than answers. Kyrie was able to get a new contract this summer, but I think has left a lot of people skeptical on his commitment after last season. And despite the fact that Durant has said that he was going to stay on the Brooklyn Nets, it just seems like Durant would drop this organization the moment there's even a slightly better situation elsewhere. So the super team roster that was Harden, Durant, and Kyrie was a huge letdown and disappointment. Primarily because these three players had only played a total of 16 games together. And in those 16 games, the Nets had gone 13-3 and, and looked like the dominant team that many people had thought that they would become. But with the sheer amount of talent this Nets roster has had over the past two years, one can only wonder what the Nets could have done if this big three was actually healthy throughout the past two seasons and actually had more time in games to gel and come together. If you guys enjoyed the video, I would greatly appreciate it if you could go on down and hit the like and subscribe button, and it lets me know what type of content you guys would like to see from this channel moving forward. So with all of that being said, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day, and I will see you all in the next video.